AMB Properties is Quincy's largest apartment rental company with hundreds of units available. They offer short term and long term rentals with one up to four bedroom apartments. AMB Properties meets the needs of its tenants with care, compassion, and a quality of service that exceeds expectations. AMB Properties also has a convenient tenant app for you to do your payments or make repair requests. Give them a call today. A and B Properties, 217-919-8080, Quincy. You don't want any part of this. Now, I will have to show you offline the menu. It's not impressive. I bet it's not. gross. They serve rice pudding for dessert, and I saw it. Yeah, it's like just... Yeah. It's just like... Did you ever see The Matrix yeah, when, they're, times. when they're eating... Oh yeah, that white. Why does it, everything taste like chicken? Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, it looks like that. Yeah, Ugh. it like looks like that in the in the yeah. Oh, I'm out. That's but, like uh, it's like meat shakes. That's like what it's made of. <laughs> it looks like. You seen that? Like all the like some of the influencers, like fitness influencers, are doing like meat shakes and stuff now. Like, meat like, shakes. Yeah, but like eight ounces of chicken and then like eight ounces of water, and they just blend it until it's a shake, and then they drink it so they can get their protein better. Really. True story. Oh. <laughs> I'm not doing that. So, but you do. Uh, but you are pretty fit, and you eat a lot of meat. Primarily meat. You are, do, you, do you have like a carnivore-based diet? Uh, other than cookie dough, yeah, for the most part. Cookie dough and I meat? Love cookie dough. <laughs> but you eat, do you eat more meat or cookie dough? Oh, meat, 100%. Yeah. Do you do like the gram per body weight? Uh, I do a little over that. Of course yeah. you do. <laughs> What's Curtis, the goal? I don't hit it every day. Uh, Curtis Sethler, um, owner of Quincy X Company, yep. Quincy Experience. Uh, you guys uh, are doing downtown sixth street promenade stuff yep. also you are uh, the regional leader manager of young life with the title yep. area director yep. uh so curtis uh, you're one of my favorite people awesome That's one of the reasons why you're on here do you know tyler myers was on here a week or two that. ago yeah, yeah. so uh, of course we um uh, i've been dropping pain shown's name a lot lately yeah. and anybody who's been listening to a lot of these pods might be like okay stop talking about pain I get it. I mean, you could give his phone number out and they could just call him directly. We should call him <laughs> and just not tell him that we're doing a pod, put him on speaker and like, just it might get interesting. It'll be great. And he's always so positive. Yeah. But then, so when I have him on eventually, yeah. you know how he always asks you and I questions. Yeah. So he is, he is obviously, man, I talk about pain too much. We need to skip over this and go to something else. But the, the truth of the matter though, is there's a reason why you and I are here and there's a reason why yeah. he's in the community and he does lots sure. of great things, but I want to turn the tables on him and hammer him with questions. Good luck. He's, he's going to try to turn it on me. Oh, yeah, very much so. He's very good at it. He's one of the best question askers I've ever been around. So, uh, you are the work that you do with young life. Yep. Um, I'm pretty impressed by that. I know you're a very humble guy most of the time. Um, unless you're, unless you're doing everything, yeah. And then someone says, why are you doing all of these things? So, for example, if our listeners don't know about Curtis, they probably do. But you're the kind of person that will. Um, so I want you, I'm, I'm going to say controversial things about you. That's fine. Okay. So you're the kind of person that will wake up in the morning. And you're, I believe you're the kind of person wakes up. And when your feet thud on the ground, the devil says, oh, no, he's up again. I hope so. And you go, you get at it. You will either drag your children, kicking and screaming, or willingly to, to the gym. Uh, my oldest daughter set her alarm for 345 this morning. I got up on her own. She beat me awake this morning. Okay. This makes sense. Has everybody in your family been to the gym early in the morning? Yeah. Okay. Not, I will say not consistently. Um, my oldest is in their... Like she wants to be in there a few days a week. Um, as as a parent, I don't necessarily think that's the best idea for her. Five days a week, just the way that the stuff she has to do and growing as a you know an adolescent, like she needs a little bit more sleep. So a few days a week, I'll I'll let her come to the gym with me and my wife, and then other days, like no, you need to sleep. Okay. Do you guys do Elf on the Shelf? Oh, we used to. Um, all of our kids have aged out. So they aged out. They all kind of know. So it's like. We got off the hook with that. The last couple of years were really fun because our oldest like would actually help us, which was kind of cool. Do you think there are any listeners right now that are hardcore into the Elf on the Shelf? 
I don't know. Do you think there are any children listening to this? That I also don't know, which is why I'm choosing my words very carefully as to like aged out and things. <laughs> Is it bad? <laughs> is it bad that I tell my children that the reason why we don't have an elf on the shelf um, is because the elf is too busy helping out all those other kids and creating mischief and all the other, and someday, someday when they're adults, they'll probably wind up getting an elf on the shelf? I think that's okay. Oh, man. I mean, when you, frame it, when you frame it that way, as long as you're not telling them it's like, it's because you're bad kids, he's not coming, like, don't, don't do that. No. But I think... I don't, I'm, I'm reluctant to use anything that's like too busy. I think that's just such a buzzword in culture. I think it's a lot of like currency we use to like assign value to ourselves. Like anytime we sit down with somebody or we talk to somebody like, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm so busy. Like that's how we respond to each other now. And I think it's just such a bogus way to live is that in this just hurried, busy, just chaos of life. And like I do a lot of things and I know that I do. And I'm very, I'm also very strategic in, in how I do things and how I add things to the list. So I, I just really, I just don't like the word busy. So if you ask me like, hey, how are you doing? I will never say like, I'm so busy. Like I'm very conscious of that. Like I may say like, I got a lot of things going on today or just bouncing from place to place. Um, but I'm never gonna tell you like, man, I'm so busy. People who say that they're too busy, I don't think they've got jack going on. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes. sometimes. So I've never heard you say that you're too busy to do anything. Yeah, I won't. I don't say, you don't have, you don't seem to have, you will not either, you either don't have limitations or you don't admit that you have a lot of limitations. Well, I think it's, it's just how I build too. It's very strategic. Like I said, like where I'm at now, I mean, started eight years ago. I mean, you could even argue that it started 15 years before that, you know, with just how I, how I build and scale things, you know, from becoming like college to becoming an adult to professionalism to all of those things. Like it's a whole bunch of different pieces that have, that have been, you know, kind of added into the mix. And once you get one kind of automated, it's like, okay, I've got that down. Now I can do a little more. And one of the first things I, first meetings I had when I came on staff with Young Life in 2016, I was with somebody here in the community and I, I'd seen their name around a bunch and I got lunch with them and I was like, dude, how do you do all of the stuff you do? And this quote, I will like carry with me to the day I die. He said, the more you do, the more you realize you can do. But for a lot of people, we have to then confront the fact that we haven't done a lot before that. And the regret that can, can come up from that, I think can be too overwhelming for some people to bear. Like you have to, if you're gonna admit like, hey, I can do more, you also have to look in the mirror and then say like, I haven't done a lot so far and I've wasted a lot of time. And that dichotomy is something like looking back and being like, man, I've messed up so much. I'm afraid to do anything else. So they don't versus like, man, I've messed up a lot. I'm not gonna let that happen again. Now's where everything changes. I'm going for everything. And that's kind of the space where, where I like to live. Do you internally think that you do a lot? No. You don't think that? No. And I know that sounds crazy, but it, I, it just is. Does your wife, Laura, think that you do a lot? I think at times, for sure. Do your kids think that you do a lot? At times. But I also think it's, it's in how we communicate with our families, too. Because I coach my kids' sports. I'm at most, like, nearly all of my kids' games. Like, I'm still heavily involved there, so it's not like I'm an absent parent. You know, I'm at pretty much everything. I went skating with my daughter this week at her school just because she asked me if I would come roller skate with her. So, like, I just went into the school and skated, and that was fun. You roller skated again? Didn't you just yeah. do that two weeks ago? Yeah. You did it twice? You're too big for roller skates. That's not true. Okay. I, them. I was much better <laughs> the second time. <laughs> okay. So have you ever heard this idea that uh, there are no bad dogs, just bad, bad dog owners? Yeah. Okay. Are there any bad kids? No. So in so. your line of work, you and I have talked about this mm -hmm. b uh, before. Well, we've talked about things. We talk about stuff. Yeah. But so there are no bad kids. Well, I'll say initially, we're all products of our environment. And we're all products of the choices that we make based on the environment that we're raised in and things like that. Like we choose for sure. But when you have kids who grow up in a very specific type of environment, whether it's, you know, super affluent and awesome and every opportunity is, you know, exp like afforded to them, they can do whatever they want versus the other end of the spectrum that's, you know, very socioeconomically depressed and all they know is that lifestyle. Like kids make choices based on that. You know, we have like students we've experienced in young life who come from just incredible stories of abuse who 
grow up and end up in jail because that's all that they know is that lifestyle because parents were involved in one thing or another. And that's all kids know. But I even, in, even then, then, like I don't put that on the kid. Like that's a product of the environment. And kids at such, kids are so impressionable. And like when they're, when they're young, when they're in that window of, you know, birth to, to 12 years old, when their like brain is developing and, and really building a subconscious. And if you know a ton about like brain science and all that, I'm a nerd, so I look into all this stuff to figure out like how kids develop. Like they're a blank computer when they're, you know, in elementary school and junior, or first part of junior high, and people are just shoving information in that. And that becomes like the subconscious. And that's what the filter that kids run things through. What do you think about, so I, I believe that, that uh, blank slate, you know, um, the old uh, Latin, La Tabula Rosa, where you're writing on them. I've also heard this other paradoxically, or, or a dichotomy of this, is kids have approximately 400 personality traits just because of their DNA and like long, um, just due to their genetic code. Yeah. And you, how do you, I mean, you've, you've, how many kids have you worked with? Oh, I, I mean, I, I'm, are we talking dozens, hundreds? Hundreds, if not. Approaching I mean, thousands? Yeah, if not that many by this point. I mean, what I get to do in the summer, I mean, I interact with hundreds of kids every week. So it's, I mean, three, 400 different students that are at our camps that we go to every summer. So, and I'm there for a month straight on some of those trips. So. Do, you, do you see any evidence that, um, you know, marrying this idea of a, a kid, there's probably something where, yes, they're a blank slate, and yes, they are who they are, and they've got their own internal battles, right? Yeah. Where, where maybe they uh, feel a certain way, probably because their father or their grandfather maybe felt that way, mm -hmm. too, just genetically. But then you can write over the top of that, too. Yeah. I think we can do it as adults, too. And, like, if we don't address it with kids and we don't teach kids to really, I don't know, process that part, you know, especially guys, like, we don't talk about, like, oh, it's just, it just is what it is, get tougher, you know, and I think that's, that's a it's mindset we, yeah. So I think, you know, with, with students and even with adults, like, we have to be aware of why we are the way that we are. And that takes a, a pretty significant deep dive into like, what, how did I grow up? What was my life like? What, what really did affected me, affect me? Who are my influences? Why do I do the things that I do? And most people will write that off and be like, this is just how I am. And they never grow. But there are the others who are like, okay, why do I think this? You know, and I think my wife is great at telling me like, hey, wait, why do you think, why did you think that? And giving me a different perspective. And I try to be, not always perfect at it, but I try to have a posture of learning within that of like, okay, wait, why did I say that? Why do I do that? And I'm like, oh, well, that's because this is, you know, how, how I grew up or the thing that my dad said or my grandfather said. So like, that's where I picked it up. How did you grow up? Now I've heard you talk about your grandfather's farm Yeah. and I've, you've done, you've, uh, I mean, so you, you do so many things. Okay. You hunt. I do. You roller skate evidently. Not well, but I do. Um, and so there's like dozens upon dozens. I actually, um, actually thought about bringing a list of all of like your well, kind of like that. i didn't do it no <laughs> thank you no no i've got other things on my sheet here like yeah that you know some some little rabbit holes that we can go down for, for fun yeah because it's fun yeah but how did you grow up where where did you grow up i actually grew up in pittsfield so 40 45 minutes from here i hated quincy growing up sports rivalries you know sockies q and d that whole thing um actually even qhs too i remember playing in a sophomore tournament basketball up here when i was sophomore in high school so Really, Quincy, honestly, is the last place on earth I wanted to live, um, and now I can't imagine living anywhere else. So, grew up, um, had a good childhood. I mean, for the most part, there was, you know, trauma like anything else within it, but nothing that was, like, incredibly out of the ordinary that I haven't seen other kids experience and thrive through. I think it, it does affect us all differently, you know, and for me, for a long time, I didn't understand how a lot of that did, did affect me, you know, and, and to even the point, again, of, like, my wife, Laura, like, asking me questions like why do you do that like I was sitting in um right before I went to the gym I was sitting in front of our we got like a five foot by five foot picture window in our living room and I had a blanket over me like over the heat vent on the floor it's like all the heat like the furnace is blowing on me and I'm like reading my read my bible in the morning before we go to the gym and doing that she's like why do you do that and I was like why do I do that like because it's such a weird thing like I don't do you know anyone else who does that like sits and puts a heat vent puts the blanket over the heat vent um no well I did when I was a kid okay I did when I was a kid because we didn't have a lot of heat in yeah. the house. Well, we had heat in the house, but there's something about even like the really oversized um, vents. 
Yeah. Where if you know where the boiler is and there's a straight shot, maybe you're getting that, like the warmest air. Yeah. Like just because you just know. You're not going to go right. to the far end of the house to do it. No. You know where the spot is right. where you can sit. So honestly, I, as a small child, I did do that. Yeah. And our kids just recently figured out that they could stand there in the kitchen because our kitchen's awesome. cold. But yeah, so yeah. you're sitting there. So you build a little fort or whatever. Yeah. I'm just sitting there like my phone um, going through my Bible, um, doing that. And Laura's like, why do you do that? I'm like, great question. I don't know. But then it like clicks. It's like we didn't have heat like in the upstairs part of our house when we grew up. We had like the big registers where heat just like would go up there. But like on really, really cold days in the winter, um, we had forced air furnace like downstairs, two story house. But like me and my brother and my sister then would like sleep. Like we would have like a camp out kind of in our dining room. But we'd all take like a heat vent and like lay on the floor in there like growing up. And then we put our feet over that and, like on those super, super cold nights. It didn't happen all the time, but it happened sometimes. I remember like sleeping like that. So it's like, there's some level of that's comfortable, that's safe, that's warm. That's like wired somewhere in the back part of my brain that I'd never really thought of like, oh, this is just what I do. Do you think kids uh, these days, like the new generations where I think over time, uh, there's this idea that the rich have gotten a lot richer mm -hmm. and the very, like the poor have, um, there's always gonna be the poor. Yeah. Well, that's a controversial statement. Um, but I'm saying, uh, what I'm trying to get at is this idea of, I think there are children that don't even know what you're talking about in terms of they have a lot. Yeah. They oh, have a sure. lot. So they're not going to remember, oh, I remember when I would wake up when I was a young kid and my room was always perfectly 72 degrees. Yeah. And I had the designer sheets and things mm -hmm. like that. Do you think there's an advantage to not having it super comfy? And... Because, I don't know, I think, have kids gotten soft? Have I gotten, has yeah, society has. gotten soft? I think culture has. But I don't, I, don't, I don't blame, like, any one thing for that. It's just, it's the nature of how we have grown. Like, I mean, it's two-day shipping on anything. Like, when I go, like, we go on vacation, or if I go to camp in the summer, I don't worry about, like, oh, I better pack that, because it can be there in two days. Like, oh, I forgot a belt. Awesome. Amazon. Like, nine ninety nine. send me a new belt. Cool. Like, sometimes it's there before I get there, because I can order one-day shipping if it takes us, you know, more than a day or two to drive somewhere. Like it's, it's all of us. And for us to like vilify like one group and say, oh, kids today. Like I know some sure, incredibly sure. hardworking kids. Like Fair. they'll work circles, like even around me. Honestly, the reason that part of the reason I am the way I am now is because we had students who were pushing themselves. And I'm like, if I want to keep up with them, I better get to work. Like, and that's like a, a side we don't often see. We see the worst of the worst when we see the news and we see kids, college age students, younger adults, whatever. We see the worst of the worst. We don't see the kids that are busting at working two and three jobs, paying for the cell phone for their family because mom and dad can't work because dad's not in the picture or mom's not in the picture. We don't see those stories. And those are probably more popular than the ones you see of kids acting up and doing silly things on the news. Is it, is it long-term in terms of the betterment of society or for an individual for a kid growing up to have some level of adversity? Is there an advantage to it? I think there's an argument for that because you have to figure out how to overcome, but you also have to have the awareness that you can. And I think a lot of people operate with such a scarcity and defeatist mindset that they see something hard and they're like, man, I just can't do that. And they turn around and walk away. You know, like there's an analogy, I think it's Ryan Holiday who says it in The Obstacle is Away, is like we walk up and you see a rock in the middle of the road, a big stone that you can't move. Most people are gonna turn around and be like, well, I'll go find a different way to go around this. And they'll walk back days if they have to. But there's a few who are going to be like, okay, where's a big stick I can use as a lever and pry this thing out of the road? You have to have the awareness and the belief in self that I can overcome this. And we, we are not a resilient culture anymore. Like you can see that in everything that we do. You know, like, dude, chat GPT is ruining the world. Like we're losing the way, like how to think. It's so easy. Like everything has gotten so much easier. Um, there's a fascinating book called The Comfort Crisis that talks about like, if you get into like the biology of humanity, we're, went, we're built to endure the extremes. Like we're built for adversity. Like we are. Like we're built to be hunters, gatherers, like all of those things. Like to go, like that's why fasting is such an effective way to diet. It's why you know, cold plunging and saunas are taking on like such, in, we're seeing such incredible growth in like cardiovascular health because of that. And there's tons of science behind that. It's not just my opinion. What's the thing with the sauna? I, I heard something about... Uh so the heat, the, the, the sauna develops and produces the heat shock proteins. Mm -hmm. Do you do, do you do heat and then cold? Yeah. Or do you do, how, how do you do it? Like, okay, if you heat had, pardon? Heat then cold. Okay. Do, so is there an advantage to going from cold to heat to cold? 
Um, I would have to look at like data on that. I don't know. I know okay. for me, it's not practical, which is the way my setup is at home. So you so, do heat and yeah. then do a cold after? I just got a cheap pop-up sauna that I've actually borrowed from someone because okay. they suggested. How hot it. does it get? Uh, I don't go by like, it, I don't think it has a total temp readout on it. I go okay. until my heart rate gets like 125, 130, and then I go in the ice. Okay. And it's gnarly. But like what it's done for like my cardiovascular health is absolutely insane. Like changing nothing else. Have you done that recently? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, I, do it. I do that a few times a week. Um, I try to sauna pretty, pretty often. Um, my brother's two, three times a week. My, man, there's a lot, you know, uh, do it yourself, build your own saunas for your home. I'm all over the Is yeah. a huge market right now. Yeah. And it used to be, it'd be not difficult to get one, but it's very easy to get one. Amazon. You could have Amazon. I mean, I'm telling you, dude. But we got to be careful, like, with the Amazon. By the way, oh, our, I love it. Our sponsors, AMB Properties. Not Amazon. Like, AMB Properties is salt of the earth. Amazon may be evil empire. Not sure. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Um, but speaking like J, like you, you, you talked about um, chat GBT. Yeah. Does any of that uh, freak you out a little bit? Or, um, or do you welcome it? Both. <laughs> like, I think when used correctly, I think, or used, like, in positive ways. Like, it's, it's like anything. Moderation and do it the right way. You know? But so many people... And like, I, I know people who do it, like, like, let's just, oh, I can just use this and spit out my whole paper for school. I'm like, that's awesome. But like, what are you like really learning right now? And that's where, you know, critical thinking and just the ability to think deeply, like we're losing that. We don't sit and ponder. We don't wander anymore. We hate being bored. We hate the sound of silence. We don't like being alone with our own thoughts. We constantly have to be entertained and click through things. That's why TikTok is so huge and all of social media really. And I'm like the, one of the worst at it because I just love Instagram. Like, I just think it's great. Most of my stuff is like leadership and personal development content or, you know, science-based stuff. But, you know, we don't, we don't just sit and think. And so much of how we develop and the awareness that I'm talking about that we need to grow comes from sitting in silence. You know, it's interesting that, that you're not, uh, like you're, you're a social media guy and an anti-social media guy. And you are kind of like a conundrum a little bit where yeah. you're hot and cold. You're up and down. You're left and right. I mean, you, you, you have a duality about you, yeah. and you're conscious of it. So, for example, like Facebook. I noticed that you do posts on Facebook. Yeah. But it's also lead, but, but it's, it, it's usually almost always lead by example type of posts. Because mm -hmm. this is what you do. Yeah. This is your way of life. Yeah. Okay, you're not going on there saying, look at me, I'm cool, the rest of you suck. Right. You are saying, look at what is possible. Look at my support system, yeah. look at how we build families, look at how we build other people's characters up, look, right. look how we build children, look how we build adults. Right. Your message is very positive. Yeah. So this idea that, you know, it, I mean, if somebody were to say who uses Facebook and social media for evil and who uses it for good, they would turn to me and say, Frankie, you use it for evil and Curtis uses it for good. <laughs> I don't think you're necessarily evil. I think you but like you, to have fun. I do have that I think you fun. poked the bear a lot. Oh, I wrote one about Taylor Swift today. I saw that. Oh, you did? By the way, Taylor Swift, does anybody in your family like Taylor Swift? Uh, loosely. Loosely? Oh, so yeah. you, like, you've, got, you've, got quite a, you've got some girls in your family. My kids are awesome, though. Yeah, but I mean, they're not, they're not going bonkers. They're like, are they Swifties? Mm -hmm. I mean, they have an appreciation for music, but okay, they're so all musicians. Okay, they're all musicians. Well, real, real quick, the, like the Taylor Swift thing, if, if people are, are, yeah. don't want to talk about it anymore, and they're, if, if everyone's really mad that yeah. Travis Kelsey really cemented this for her, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't think it's how that works. No, I don't think it's how it works. I mean, she's brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, what's up like, with Time Magazine? Uh, Hitler won that yeah. award once. Stalin won it twice. That's a dangerous comparison. <laughs> I'm not comparing Taylor Swift to those guys, but I'm saying it's not... Time Magazine's point, I'm not defending them. Yeah. I probably don't like Time Magazine, probably. I probably don't like those kind of publications, but um, just a personal thing. But I'll say something positive about Taylor Swift. Generically speaking, I, I don't think that Time Magazine just puts people out there that they right. think are the best people in the world. Yeah, They're taking a look at it like, who is making a global impact to the point yeah. where this person's a household name? Yeah. And this person is doing huge things on some level. Yeah. 
So with Hitler, he's doing huge things in a really bad yeah. way. With Taylor Swift is she's a um, she takes kind of the feminine mystique and kind of brings it to the surface mm -hmm. and says, oh, look what yeah. I'm doing. Um, she's making a million dollars per, per show. And somebody said something like, uh, well, you know, if, if Taylor Swift had a concert here near Quincy, a lot of people from Quincy would go, and it would be good for the economy. Uh -huh. I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, every single person who's buying tickets just got poor and she got richer, so that's a fair trade, I guess. Yeah. But uh, if you had to pick somebody here, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you had to pick somebody for, and you can't say your wife, Laura, okay? So Laura. She would freak out if I did that anyway. I mean, she likes it and doesn't like it. It's both. She's like, okay, give it a rest. And yes, yep. I know you love me. I yep. get it. Also, chill out. Yep. Um, but you guys have a great marriage. Um, who would you pick for person of the year considering the planet? Yeah, that's... That's, a, that's an unfair question because I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, and so, I, I really don't know. Um, I don't follow a lot of like hype on social media. Like It's just not what I feel fill my head with. I think there's just some, I think there's some fascinating people that are out there. I do think like one thing in defense of like Taylor Swift winning this, um, I think that her stance against the music industry overall and like having to fight to get her music back because she doesn't even own the rights to her original music. Like they sold that without, without like, you know, consulting her or even offering her the opportunity to buy it. Like it just sold and she doesn't own any of the originals mm -hmm. and she went to war and actually re-recorded all of that stuff to get it back essentially. So, I mean, what she has done for artists in general over the last several years is something that's just absolutely fascinating. And as somebody who loves music, like I have just a deep appreciation for that. I think she's also, she's largely written all of her own songs and built a lot of that on her own, which is something that's very unique um, with the exception of probably a lot of heavier rock music, especially like in the pop scene, like there's multiple writers and things. And she's always been very, very true about like I, I do this, like I write these songs, which is cool. So I think, and what she's done just to, to take the concert thing and put it in a movie theater too, to be the first one to do that, you know, to really make concerts available because concerts are crazy expensive right now, unless you're going to punk rock shows. Well, so we've got some mutual friends that went to one of her shows and they reported kind of back to me. I said, so how was the show in this? And I won't say who it is because I'm outing him as like this dude who went to Taylor Swift concert, yeah. Swifty. He's, he's not, but he went with his daughters. Cool. He goes, Frank, let me tell you something. I have seen so many different shows, and I'm not a Taylor Swift guy. I will tell you this. It was unbelievable. Yeah. It was you, the energy and the light show and the feeling and the production of it is something yeah. that I've never seen before. And even if you see it, so there's a Netflix there's like a Taylor Swift like reputation yeah. tour thing on Netflix, and my kids are all about it. See, that's yeah. the, see that's how I know Taylor Swift's music is good, yeah. is because I have a little eight, seven, four year old, yeah. and they know they know nothing about music, yeah. and they love it. There's my like little jab, yeah, because like it's not Pink Floyd, right? It's not. Mine are all it's not, to it's, to, it's not Radiohead. Mine are all want to go to punk rock shows. Oh yeah. So. Okay. So how many? <laughs> so how many punk rock shows have you taken? our kids do my uh all of we went to a family show to a band called the interrupters a little while back which is awesome they're a female-led band from california that's fantastic um just just a killer band they're actually pretty much i think everybody in the band is family at this point so um it's kind of cool but um really yeah it's a great show that was the first show first punk rock show that i took my oldest daughter to that just like me and her went to and like she got to meet the lead singer and like sang with her because she came down like we my oldest daughter's only been in like the front row at shows, which has just set a standard that I just, I'm never going to be able to keep up, but it keeps happening. So we've got like our favorite spot at the pageant when we go, she knows right where to go when we get in there and locks it down to her front row. Oh, and, cause it's GA. Yeah. So it's whoever fights to get that spot, right? right? Okay. But we, we go, I mean, we'll go way early. We'll sit in line for hours just to hang out, um, to get in to see our favorite bands. And it's just such a cool thing. Like I always want, I, I've loved music since I was a kid. Music got me through a lot of things. Um, you know, being in a, I was born in 82, so Nirvana and like the early 90s and all that. And growing up in small town, like listened to country until the first time I heard Nirvana and like everything changed. And, you know, went through like the whole mid 90s, which is the best era for music. Oh, man. Just unbelievable. And being able to grow up through that. Right. Like, like junior high to high school. Oh, yeah. To like being a kid. Yeah. yeah because, uh, so I mean, you're, you're at the, the, the back end of Gen X. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
I think you and I have talked about this, but this term exennial, yeah. which is like, you're old enough to know all about the old stuff yeah. and young enough to, to like bridge the gap to yep. the new. Mm -hmm. And that continues because right. we had great music. Oh, for sure. So I was born in 77. So like, if you look up, if you go to, um, if you go to the internet and look up exennial, there's going to be a Wikipedia page about it. Sure. And it's going to say 77 to 82. Yep. There's this like this five year time where, so who is the really, hold on, it's, I'm, I just lost the name. I mean, my, my grandparents, I remember listening to my grandparents' mu music. Mm -hmm. I mean, old stuff. Yeah. Like Patsy Cline. Yep. Okay. And then my parents' music was it was either you know it's either Stones or Beatles or Elvis it's one of the three yeah pro 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 probably but then they were young enough having kids to where now they're in the 80s mm -hmm. and so I'm you know I'm listening to Duran Duran yeah. well, my father and my mom and dad are listening to Boston okay and Duran Duran and Fleetwood Mac okay and so is there some Zeppelin in there sure is there some is there some Beatles in there sure but then we're but we're deep in the 80s yeah and then Michael Jackson comes out. And then game changer. that's the game changer. And I've said before, but I wasn't allowed to touch my father's uh, turntable okay. ever. So he's got all of the albums and I can look at the albums, but I'm not allowed to take mm -hmm. the vinyl out. Right. And you know, and he had a collection about this big, which is big enough. Yeah. A vinyl that's big enough, it's right? A lot. It's a lot. In 82 and 83, I thought it was the world. I thought here's the discography of the world. This is what, this is, this is everything. And now I know it's not true, but yeah. it still feels like everything in some weird way. Yeah. But my father let me take the Thriller album cellophane off, take the, take the vinyl off, put it on the table. He instructed me very carefully, yep. had a really nice pioneer turntable from Singapore that he bought when, I think when he was in Vietnam wow. and which I'm wearing his jacket. You know, very cool. Right. So we're, we're sitting there and he allows me to put it on and the very first track on Thriller is want to be starting something mm. and go listen to that i mean michael jackson depending on what you think about michael jackson yeah but uh the music didn't hurt anybody no <laughs> so bad joke but um but so your love of music what what's it like living in pittsfield in the 80s and did you abandon country music and move into the punk rock i did, i would I wouldn't say I abandoned it. Um, I push back, and even now, like I push back pretty hard against like '90s country, and even a lot of like more popular country now. Because um, it's terrible. Uh, it. I'm big on like Nirvana is a great example, and I used to get like made fun of just because I would like I want to hear like artists are passionate about what they're doing. Like I want to I want to hear that emotion as they're singing. Like I want it to I want it to feel real. I don't like auto tune. Like I artists make mistakes. Like I play guitar and do that stuff. I make mistakes all the time. I think that's just a part of music, like perfection and auto tune and like punching in, punching out as you're recording things. I just think is so inauthentic and like the authenticity behind it is, is the part that makes music beautiful to me. So like, and I'm a nerd when it comes to it too. So, I mean, I, when I first, I remember the first time I ever heard Nirvana, I remember the, the video that it was and my dad was clicking through channels. I was walking down the stairs at our house in Pittsfield. Like I literally remember it this vividly. What was it? Was it bleach no, or it was, uh, never mind? Never mind. In like okay. 90, that came out and like they did that show in 92. So it had been shortly after that when it was on MTV and it was aneurysm. It was the first song I heard. I'd never heard anyone scream like that. Right. I was like, what is that? Go back. And I remember this like super vividly. And it wasn't long after that. Like I remember going to Walmart and I bought, you know, I, I don't know, talk to people, figure out what, what their first album was because they were blowing up then. And Bleach was their first album. And I bought all of their albums in order because I'd look at the years on them when they're at Walmart and like bought all of them in order up to that point. And like when I really got into them, like Kurt died. So it was like, okay, now what? And that's where like Green Day enters in like the chat and a whole bunch of the punk rock stuff. Cause I would research and like listen to interviews with artists back then. Cause you could hear like, okay, who influenced you? And like mm -hmm. for Nirvana, it was a lot of queen, but like it went all the way back to the thirties to lead belly with 12 string guitar, just Delta river, like really? Red river stuff. Yeah. And that's that's who in, that's who uh, I was like that's Kurt, that, that's Kurt stuff biggest inspiration. Wow! And if you get into that stuff, like it's it's when they would drag recording equipment into prisons and record people and put it out. And, and if you dig into this stuff, like it's some of the the craziest stuff. But it also became some of like the biggest hits in 
the sixties too came from like re recordings of this stuff. Like, um, is it house of the rising sun by the animals? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows was actually a lead belly song. Oh, like, but you don't hear that song ever. Like, where did you sleep last night that Nirvana did on unplugged, which is my favorite song on that whole thing was lead belly. Like just such a great song. And I will chase the history of the bands that I like back to their influences just to the minutia. So that gets me into some pretty, pretty crazy bands. Um, as you, as you go back through like punk rock stuff and like my parents growing up, like my dad listened to a ton of Springsteen riding around. So like, that's what he listened to. My mom listened to queen. Um, and then whenever we went on road trips to family or whatever, it was always like those cruising classics albums, a lot of Billy Joel and, and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a weird mix of music that I grew up on between like rock and pop and like all of that. And I, but the country side of it kind of came from my grandparents. I remember Kenny Rogers on eight track, listening to the gambler and stuff like that. And Johnny Cash live at Folsom prison. Um, a lot of Waylon Jennings, early stuff like that, little Hank Williams. And as I've dug deeper into music and just really just myself, like I've got just a massive appreciation for old country. It's like, I love Hank all the way through, yeah. like Hank four is making music now for yeah. in the strange band, like love that stuff. It's weird, but I love it. Um, and it's just like the mess that music can be because it doesn't have to be as overproduced and cookie cutter, the same thing, the same thing, the same thing as radio friendly. Like I, I don't listen to radio really at all. It's all either my Apple music account on shuffle Spotify or um, XM. If I want to listen to like some newer stuff that's out there. You play an instrument. Mm -hmm. A couple. A couple. I play guitar and bass. Okay. I knew you played bass. I didn't know you played what six string, mm -hmm. like regular guitar. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes you play at Madison Park. Yep. Do you ever play anywhere else? Uh, not really. I used to. Okay. I used to play a little bit. Um, do you play at home? Yeah. Do you play with the kids? Uh, we're working on that. So my oldest daughter, I want to jam with her all the time. Like I just absolutely do. She will listen to the radio and figure out how to play music on her own on piano. And just it's infuriating how just gifted she is. Because she'll just be sitting down and playing. I'm like, is that 30 seconds to Mars? She's like, yeah, it's the kill. I'm like, how did you learn that? She's like, I just listened to it. And on piano? Play. Yeah. See, that's a beautiful thing. So if, if she's playing piano, which piano is a really neat instrument because yeah. it, it's a percussion instrument. Yeah. She's in percussion at junior high. So you're playing a stringed instrument, but to have piano and bass guitar together, I mean, I don't want to say that's all you need. I mean, it's going to take it's a lot for cool. you guys to get a horn section. Yeah. And it's gonna, or it's going to take a lot to get... I've got lots of effects Drums. on my electric guitar. We've got a drum set in the house too. So. Oh, but I mean, with all of with all the synth stuff, mm -hmm. do you have any like apps where you do? You, yeah. Do you have anything where you can like put in a beat? Yeah. And then maybe she's I pretty much have a studio at my house. Like it's. A, oh, you do. Yeah, I've got a mixing board and all that stuff that I can. It's stuff that I've just put together over the years. It's nothing I've spent like a ton of money on because don't have a ton of money to throw at it. So when I can pick something up for cheap, I just always have my eye out. So we we pick up something here and there, and then we build. You know what we have so we've got piano and amps and i actually just got a another amp that i picked up for a little bit of nothing that's awesome um, i borrowed one from a buddy of mine and it was like you're never getting this back <laughs> and he's like no, i need it back and then i found another one um very similar to it actually it's the same one just a newer model that can i we, love can we get young life to buy the y so we can reopen the pool <laughs> uh that's out of my hands <laughs> well um didn't you go over to colorado like recently or talk to a big a big wig over on Colorado. Can um, you talk about that or no? Because I mean, because I'm, it's I'm a, this is like a, Young Life is a huge organization. Yeah, like really big. Yeah, it's one of the biggest nonprofits on the planet. Like it's how, huge. Do you know? I mean, off the top of your head, do you know how big it is? I mean, not annual revenue. I know that like the impact is two million new students a year around there. I mean, I mean, how many? Okay, well, what? Yeah. Okay, that's bigger than I, than I thought. It's massive. Like it really is. Is it in every state? Yeah. In the United States? Oh, yeah. Young Life is in every state. It's in 110 plus countries. Like, it's huge. And you're the area director yeah. of, and what what is the area, generally speaking? Just Quincy. Just Quincy? Quincy, okay. I'd say Adams County. Um, we do a little bit outside of that, but not much. But, I mean, you really couldn't do any a bigger space than that. That's a lot of people. Yeah, I, I would never leave our space anyway. We have the most ridiculous facility outside of a Young Life-owned property. Yeah, it is pretty nice. Yeah, I got confirmation pretty much on that a couple of weeks ago from some people who are in town that are more heavily involved with higher level young life stuff so do you uh, this is kind of this I, I don't know if i should have asked you this before i asked the question but that's what i do you know what yeah. i do i ask questions i just won't answer it if i don't want to yeah you'll say pass <laughs> say frankie be quiet <laughs> just stop um what 
what would young life do if if there was a mom or dad or guardian or friend that knew of a a youth and just needed to to talk to somebody how yeah. easy is that to get done just to connect to somebody just to connect super easy like how how they do it i mean you call our office message our facebook page or instagram page what, what, what's your facebook page called young life quincy young y, life quincy yeah, y l q c y and so in, it'll pop this up. is kind of like a you know the term safe space i can make fun of that term but it's not really funny when you're talking about it in a genuine way right you know like i think young life is a true safe space like my home is yeah. a safe space you well, know i mean we have the wall in the in the building that like every kid who comes in there has an invitation to sign and it's got i mean if it doesn't have a thousand names on that by now i would be shocked okay. like it's just names on top of names but it says young life and then like, like the title underneath that is this is home and it's a spot where every kid no matter no matter what culture would say divides them they belong and we've had i mean affluent kids super poor kids um every part of town you know every ethnicity in there any orientation or identity you can imagine like we've had those students in there and there, it's a place where there is no division it really is and we're we're absolutely absolutely true to that and that's one thing we tell kids like we we're a faith-based organization we're not a church and you know, we're sharing the gospel with kids but we do that in a way that's ultra relational like i was at you know with meeting with our junior high kids today and it's a little bit late getting here because I was finishing that up. But well, no, you said you'd be here at four oh five, and you got here at four oh five. So I don't know how how, how late you were. I, I felt scarily later. on time. Um, but you know, I was sharing, you know, sharing what we we do a thing called the talk at the end, which is real life and faith, and where those two things intersect. And we're talking about like, you know, from the faith part of it, like Jesus crucifixion and like payment for sin, and like we all deserve punishment and stuff like that. So like to start that conversation, that's heavy stuff, right? Heavy for junior high kids. But we're talking, you know, with them of like, you guys ever messed up? And you got anybody ever like cover your butt when you should have gotten in trouble? And I shared a story out of from my life, and I'm like, I'm I know you have these stories where somebody like probably covered for you to keep you from getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. I have them. Yeah. Um, so I just told the kids one of those stories, true story from my life where I'm relating this to kids, and that's how we really that's the tail end of the night. But we have that talk that's real life and faith, and where those two things intersect. And then after that, it's like before you leave, like I want you to know, like this is a spot where you fit in no matter what, no matter what culture what culture would say divides you what you think divides you this is your spot and when you put your name on something it changes everything so there's a wall upstairs like we want you to go up there and sign your name on that wall because this is your place and what we've seen is like i've been volunteering with young life or on staff with them for 10 years now and i cannot i mean i could tell you dozens and dozens of stories of life changing kids because their name is on that wall i sent a girl here in town um actually just got her law degree. I sent her a picture of her name and she caught like messaged me back. was like, man, I wrote that really big, kind of like just egotistical of me. I was like, no, you just knew you were going to do big things. Like you knew you were b built for something bigger. So you signed your name that big and now you're living into it. Like I hadn't talked to her for a while. I know she hadn't even thought about her name being on that wall, but I sent her that. And like, and I'll do that to kids all the time when we're in the building. I'm like, I'll on their birthday or something, if it pops up in, in our uh, database that it's their birthday, I'll just send them a picture like, hey, happy birthday. Still remember when you put your name up here. Those little things, you know, and it's, it's a ton of just what I do in the core of who I am, like just letting people know that they're known. You know, that's the, the core of young life is just showing up. Like we show up in kids' lives because we believe Jesus showed up in our life. Like that's the core. We go and we do because we serve a God who came and went and does so we just, we do that. We live out our faith. And however kids respond to that, that's however kids respond. But right now we're at a deficit as a culture of adults showing up in kids' lives. Like we want to know what's wrong with kids. It's adults. They don't have people showing them how to live life. They just don't. We have parents who don't do anything with their kids. They view their kids largely as a liability or as, you know, a, a distraction or a deterrent from doing what they really want to do. And kids know that. Kids feel that. Yeah, it's it's you know you know there's kids that maybe they uh, maybe their parents are checked out and they they need help, but there are kids that have two parents, absolutely nuclear family, everything's perfect on the outside, yeah. but it's not. There, yeah. There's problems for sure. And there's so do you guys still do do you still do that camp? Yeah, we do camps every summer. Where do you guys so, go? Uh, this we go to a lot of different ones. Young Life owns over thirty properties in the U.S. that are just phenomenal. Um, they're more like five star resorts. They're not like your what you're thinking, like a church camp or something. They're ridiculous. 
Uh, so our high school students are going to a camp called Timberwolf Lake in Lake City, Michigan this summer, and our junior high kids are going to a camp called Castaway Club, which is in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. So those are the two camps our, our main group of students are going to. Our teen mom group, Young Lives, will be going to Timberwolf also at a different, a different camp week. Um, and we've got a program for special needs students called Capernaum that will go with our high school students to Timberwolf also. So we've got... Like as in the biblical Cap Capernaum? Yeah, that's what it's the that's what our special needs program is named after. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do so without having like you know hundreds or thousands of people like rush to call Young Life tomorrow? Yeah. And say, hey, I want my kid to go to all these camps because yeah. that could be like you know. Yeah, we do need. have a limited number of spots. Like, yeah. We're allocated that we okay. get um, just because the organization is so big and camps are and we can only do so many weeks of camp a summer. So we get allocated spots. Um, we've got more. We have more availability to go this summer than we've ever had before. Um, which is super cool. Like our, our camp numbers have gone up every year because the impact of Young Life in Quincy continues to grow. Um, largely that's because of our volunteers. Like we have an incredible volunteer team who serve at our schools. Um, they mentor students in Quincy Public Schools. They go and they hang out with kids. You know, they, they pick up students or students will meet them. Like, can I just go grocery shopping with you? Like how many of us like hate going to the grocery store? Yeah. Like literally one of our leaders like a student tech just say, hey, what are you doing? It's like, I'm gonna go to Walmart. It's like, cool, can I meet you there and just walk around the store with you? And they just went shopping. Like that's, that is the level of like relational deficit we're operating at where kids just want to hang out with an adult who pays attention to them so much that they're willing to go walk around Walmart for hours. Because, because parents don't want to go shopping with their, not all, not all parents, some parents, I need to qualify that. Some yeah. parents don't want to bring their kids shopping. Yeah. And then if you never bring your kids shopping, which I, by the way, as a, as a father of three kids, I understand this yeah. very much so yeah but sometimes i'll pick like one kid i'll let i'll, I'll whisper in my wife's ear i'm like hey i'm gonna go to high yeah. b um i will take one kid which kid do you want me to take yeah. she'll say um oh take so and so he or she's been terrible today and yeah. needs something i'm like okay i'm like yeah. hey don't make a big deal about this like, right. to, like valentino put your shoes on don't let the other kids see you put your shoes right. on meet me by the car in three minutes i'm gonna go to the bathroom I'll be there. Yeah. You know, and then you zip away. Because mm -hmm. I don't want to take three kids to, to the store, yeah. but there are kids whose parents don't ever take them anywhere because of life. Right. And so you, you're saying that you've got, you guys have kids at Young Life that say, please just let me walk around with you at a store. Yeah. That kind of like melts my, my hardened yeah. heart a little bit, yeah. Curtis. When your kids get bigger, you can also divide and conquer, which gets you out of the grocery store even faster. Oh, so, give them a cart and I take a cart? Well, just, no, I wouldn't give them all carts because oh. I'll just go crazy. But you yeah. send them after individual items and they just like pff, scatter through the store. Yeah, tear you know? off a sheet. Yeah, go get Stay Cheerios. Here. All right, cool. See ya. All right. And they yeah. bounce and go get that. Cool. Go get two gallons of milk. Awesome. They run and grab that and bring it back. And then you're just punching through your list and you're in and out super quick. Last question. Bring it. Um, <laughs> camp. I really, what is the most fun thing that you guys do at camp? And something funny or hard or. Maybe something, maybe something bad happened that had a good ending or something that, um, cause when, when you go, you go for a week or two, you are off. Nobody sees or hears from, from you no, uh, when you're gone. Like yeah. the last time you went, yeah. I mean, I didn't, I had things that I, I had things to ask you, yeah. but I'm not going to bother you when you're at camp. Yeah. Not cause you wouldn't respond, right. but I just know you've yeah. kind of told me in the past, you're like, yeah, when I'm there, like, I don't look at my phone. Like I'm just there. I'm super yeah. present wherever we go we so because yeah. we take we take kids phones so they don't have their <clears> phone for a week either like when we get there we turn in phones we put them in a big like uh tupperware tub and then they're up for the week so kids don't have their phones when they're young like yeah, well, kids shouldn't even have phones but anyway yeah so <laughs> that so um my favorite one of my favorite just like camp memories is actually watching in colorado at the camp uh, we were at out there or i was actually at um watching the sunrise over the rockies from a hot tub at 30 degrees below zero one winter we were out there i was out there for a, a leadership conference type thing but like it's it's a young life property and like kids get to watch this in the summer like 30 degrees below zero sitting in a hot tub at young life camp watching the sunrise over the rockies absolutely one of the most beautiful things i've ever seen in my life the kids get to watch the sunrise over the rockies when they're out at the camp our kids were out there a couple of years ago and got to experience that too it's just stunning wow. watching that happen Wow. Um, my favorite, absolute favorite camp moment, though, um, we had a student several years ago, um, again, on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, a student was in foster care, um, had largely disengaged foster parents. Um, you know, how foster care system works, they get a, a stipend, a check, because he's there. Um, 
kind of did whatever he wanted. Uh, but we do fundraisers to help kids go to camp because we're a nonprofit. Obviously, we're all locally supported. Um, so we do fundraisers because our camp budget actually exists outside of our operating budget. So we fundraise that money in, in addition to our operating budget. So we had some fundraisers we were doing. We were selling Krispy Kreme donuts. This kid came up to me. He's like, Curtis, like, I really want to go to camp, man. I have no one to sell donuts to. Like, I have, like, literally no one. Like, I, like no one I know has money. Like, I'm in foster care. Like, I don't know what to do. I was like, you try. You sell one box of donuts. I will take care of the rest of your camp. Like, I'll find somebody to sponsor you to take care of it. You try. I will drive you to deliver whatever you whatever you sell. I'll take care of it. I'll drive you around. We can do it. Dude ended up selling like 12 boxes of donuts, which is awesome. He's paid for like $100 of his camp trip, which is great. Super excited that he did that. I drove him all over town because it was literally one into town to the other people he found to buy donuts, which was super cool. But we go to camp that summer, and it was actually at Timberwolf. And we pull in, uh, the guy that started Young Life had this idea that well, if you pull up to a Young Life camp and say, wow, there's a really good chance you'll say wow to Jesus while you're there. That's the quote from him. And that is that is the extent these camps are built to. They're like nothing you've ever seen. Um, everyone should go to get on YouTube and look these things up. They're ridiculous. But we pull in the circle drive at Timberwolf and this kid stands up and looks out the window of the bus and then looks at me and sprints through the bus. It was like, are you kidding me? This is what we get, this is where we get to live for the next week. And like the, one of the biggest and just most impactful hugs I've ever experienced. Like I'm getting chills right now just thinking about it. Like that moment of like this kid who should have never been there, everything stacked against him. And he gets to go and experience this. And like in his life has taken some turns since he's graduated and, and become an adult. And this has been six, five years ago now, six okay. years ago now. Um, but you know, when we have these kids and we have the opportunity to impact them, like I know that that memory is going to stick with them, you know, forever, like that camp week. And, you know, kids consistently say, like, Young Life Camp is the best week of their life. I met somebody this week. She's like, I remember when I went to camp in North Carolina. I was like, what? Like, you're in Quincy now? Like, where, where were you? And we had this whole conversation that centered around Young Life Camp because it's that big of an impactor on kids. And we get the opportunity to take kids from Quincy, high school students and junior high students and teen moms to camp every summer. Um, it's something we take very seriously um, because we know the impact and the eternal impact that can happen there, too. You know, a lot of our kids don't get to do stuff like this, and we want to make sure that every kid who wants to go to camp can go to camp. Curtis Seffler. Yeah, man. Thanks, man. Yeah, dude. Talk to you soon. Thanks for having me. Always. Cool. AMB Properties is Quincy's largest apartment rental company with hundreds of units available. They offer short-term and long-term rentals with one up to four bedroom apartments. AMB Properties meets the needs of its tenants with care, compassion, and a quality of service that exceeds expectations. AMB Properties also has a convenient tenant app for you to do your payments or make repair requests. Give them a call today. AMB Properties, 217-919-8080, Quincy.